Welcome everyone to one more episode of Straightforward. Very excited to be here today with Andre Rebroff, a CTO and co-founder of a very cool startup, uh, Sandbird. Uh, welcome, Andre, to the show. Thank you for having me here today. We're here to talk about headless commerce, uh, which has been, you know, such a, a, a lot of hype uh, behind you know, headless commerce with a lot of promises, you know, uh, kind of a trying to bring the best of two worlds together. You know, a lot of uh, customization and, and personalization and ability, you know, to customize uh, any, any e-commerce experience uh, to customers' needs and still uh, having all the, the benefits of uh, moving fast and, and, and benefits of, you know, uh, a package uh, e-commerce solution. Right? So uh, it looks really good and exciting. And uh, we're here with Andre today to, 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 so, so he can share with us um, his experience at Sandbart uh around how this commerce so andre uh your 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 initial uh, thoughts and if you can just describe when did you start that journey and then what what uh what you were expecting in the beginning and, and maybe what uh what you actually were able to achieve uh during that journey that that would be really good to provide the audience here some context on, on the conversation we're going to, to have here today so you're asking me how long you've been uh, in this journey and it's Partially, we've always been somewhat of headless commerce because since day one, Sandbird was a homegrown solution that was created uh, with microservices idea in mind. Yes, obviously it started with one big service, like it's usually called monolith service, but over time we created a bunch of systems and the idea was always the same. We want to have the best platform, best service for our customers. And yes, unfortunately, a lot of great names, great services on the market, they were built to fulfill one purpose, but that what that wasn't what we were looking for because we were a subscription commerce, subscription service for perfumes, fully customizable with a lot of custom elements. And even if we use something off the shelf, we still had to write it a lot. So that's why we started our journey with a custom development um, but uh, as um, i believe you know and by talking to every every ceo or every manager uh, these days you know that the more and more problematic uh, situation right now is how to retain uh, your team and this is especially difficult for the engineering team because the engineering team they're not getting cheaper they're getting more expensive and having one team here in the united states might cost you easily a million of dollars a year, just one team. Imagine how many teams you need to have a proper e-commerce website with a front store, with a CRM, an admin, and so on and so forth. So having the same uh, thought in mind, we actually had a lot of discussion earlier this year about what should we do next? Because we don't consider ourselves a technology company. We don't create platforms. We don't create services. We sell perfume. So we decided, okay, uh, considering what we have in, in mind, and that was improving our e-commerce offering, because since day one, we were a subscription service, we said, okay, what should we do uh, having this roadmap in front of us so we don't spend a lot of time building a simple blocks like a car, discount engine, loyalty engine, team and so on and so forth. And then it was a moment when we discovered and decided to go into the headless commerce way. Because for me, as a technologist, it represents the best of two worlds, as you said. On one hand, it is a custom, uh, it's a small service built to deliver one uh, purpose and one purpose only. And on the other hand, based on the knowledge of the industry, it already does what you needed to do. For example, if you're talking about the card, uh, card model, it does what cards should do. You can enter the card, you can remove from the card, it can calculate uh, the uh, subtotal, it can calculate tax, and so on and so forth. Same for product information model, same for discount engines, and so on and so forth. So we just we decided that we want to go this way early this year. And then it took us about two months to go through the various players because, unfortunately, again, as you mentioned, there is a lot of buzz about headless commerce right now. Every company, that every service that exists in the e-commerce space call themselves now uh, headless, headless commerce. Everything became headless overnight. Isn't it incredible? <laughs> 
it is incredible. The power <laughs> of marketing is here. Yeah. So if it took me so like a couple of weeks uh, to just a list of services who are actually head of commerce who do what we need to do. And then uh, maybe in a month, we're able to talk to them, understand what they're capable of, what we can build together, how hard it will be to, to build with them. And then started this moment, we decided our implementation. And that's, again, another beauty of headless commerce, because unlike traditional platforms, when you either, like when you have to launch everything at once, like you, you do this so-called big bank launch when you spend, an, I don't know, a year, two years on like configuring all the things, if you can launch service by service. For example, we decided to start with PIM, product information model, because it's foundational. You need product to add them to the cart. You need products in order to create an order. You need you need products because you want to build uh, discounts based on product. So we started with requirement. We just, we started with understanding how do we want it to work for, for us. And now uh, the team is working on on this implementation. Once it's done, it will be already in production. It will already serve its purpose, and we will we will move on and we'll continue to build. And like this is what I'll like a lot about this approach like you can deliver value as soon as possible got it in a in a at this point so at this point have you migrated the whole e-commerce to to, a, to the new architecture or file the commerce or still no. in a, still migrating it we're still migrating it uh but because we also have a lot of legacy in different par parts of the uh infrastructure and we are also trying to do what's called decoupling because as I mentioned, we were a subscription companies and like all of our custom development was tied really close to subscription. And yes, it was great for its purpose. But when we started to do more on the commerce uh, side, uh, we saw problems uh, for business department, for merchandising, for marketing, for operations. And this is what we're also trying to do right now. We're trying to decouple it and make it work for everyone in the organization. So I would say by the end of this year, maybe by the beginning of the next one, it will be done. So I would say it's six to eight months project, which is which I can consider shared in, in our industry for migration yeah. of that water of that size. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. In, in a from the the modules that are, you already migrated, right? So, uh, uh, do you think uh, is is the the that those modules are they living up to the expectation of uh, of uh, be the best of the two worlds? They can not only be able to you know, be flexible and be customizable in an easy way, and also be cost effective, like you know, to reduce mm -hmm. the cost of maintenance. Uh, are, 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 is it delivering to the promise? I think so, because we actually put this as one of the goals of the project. We would love to, like, as we decouple business logic, we also want to decouple engineering team from day-to-day -day activities that operations team might have or merchandising team uh, has. So our goal is to, is to, by the end of migration, to provide a tool to all these teams that they can use to add new products fully by themselves. Even if it's a completely new product, they should be able to do so. Uh, they should be able to modify it. Um, they should be able to do almost everything they want with one exception. Right in the beginning of the project, we decided, hey, let's discuss the constraints, both technical constraints that the platform has and the business constraint that we as a business have, because um, that's, that's a constraint that comes with every of the show product. It was built with limited functionality. Over time, we will have more functionality as the company delivers it. But still, there are certain things that you cannot do. And we made it transparent to every stakeholder. Hey, guys, you won't be able to do that. Our engineers now won't be able to go directly into the database and fix it. So let's discuss what we can do. And let's discuss what kind of workaround we'll be able to have in order to fix if something goes wrong. If something like that happened, it will mean that we lost the time and now we have to recreate, let's say, a product from the beginning. Or let's say, if there was a big mistake in, uh, in discount creation, now we have to recreate the discount. Now we have to recreate the whole marketing campaign, for example. Yes, it's a cost, but on the other hand, you now 
give people the tool to to use for example you give the discount engine to marketing team and now they can create any uh a campaign every day if they want and don't wait for the engineering team and they will be ready uh, for the holiday campaign let's say one month earlier than expected that's great so so that that's that's really a a, a great uh, uh prospect for people that are actually uh looking at you know going headless not only e-commerce but other other type of platforms that i guess you say like every, everything is headless now uh because it's just too too promising in terms of uh, productivity and uh and flexibility right? So, so uh, it, it looks like Nirvana, right? But uh, it usually, it's in, in, it, before you get to Nirvana, you have to uh, go go into go go through a little bit of a you know challenges. And so, can, can you tell me like what what are what are the what are the main challenges that you have to go through to mm -hmm. get to, to the to, to the to the new, this new architecture? So it may be uh, insightful for other people that are, mm -hmm. are willing to take that journey, right? So, what 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 do you tell them that uh, to pay attention to and and to to you know to, to mm -hmm. get prepared for uh, the, the, for the journey. Absolutely. So I would say in general, uh, when you deal with headless commerce and migration to headless commerce, you could be in one of two buckets. You either had everything custom built or you were on the platform. So I will start with what we have, what we experience, and then I will share some of my thoughts in regards to the second situation. So when you have everything built in-house and everything is customized and especially if this platform is old uh, when you migrate to have this commerce you will have to do a proper investigation of how your platform actually works because i believe in many cases people who originally built some functionality or requested some functionality might not be already in the company so you might have this checkbox you might have this drop down in your interface but no one knows what it does. People just follow the instruction when they complete it. And that's what they gave us. Like we had a very cluttered interface. And this is also what we are trying to do right now. So we spend, I would say, proper amount of time going through every screen, going through every backend method, every database uh, table connected to it in order to understand how does it work? Do we need it? Or should it be transformed to something else? So I would say the first thing, um, dedicate a proper amount of time in order to understand how your platform actually works right now. If you have a proper documentation, God bless you for keeping it up to date. So that's one. Number two, uh, don't try to build the best, uh, best integration ever because the temptation will be big to not just migrate, but to build the ideal system. And this is uh, might be problematic because most likely your business stakeholder will push for it. But don't forget, you're migrating to, to something new for you. So first, you should grow, then walk, then run. So first, give your business stakeholder something to learn, something to use, something to adapt to. Then once they understand how the platform actually works, what are the pros? What are, what are the cons? Like, what's easy to do? What's hard to do? Then try to increment and try to improve. Like start with a simple migration of what you had, maybe with removing some of the things that you don't actually need. So, like in this case, you will have uh, small wins when people will migrate to the interface. They will appreciate how simple it is to use right now, and uh, they will vouch for you in the future. And the third uh, advice is um, don't try to migrate everything at once. Like, under, like try to understand what are the dependencies here and focus on bringing this still into the production. Because for example, in our case, we decided, hey, pro uh, product information model is the foundational stone. We need to migrate it first. Once it's there, we can build OMS, we can build a card and user profiles. Once that done, now we can actually migrate discounts. And once that done, once we fully migrate to our headless commerce platform, uh, partner platform, now we can bring other tools to build on top of it. Now we can um, bring proper search and feed management. Now we can bring a platform, a proper loyalty platform, and so on and so forth. So be incremental. Think of smaller releases that can actually bring value to your uh, to stakeholders because everyone is started of these big enterprise projects, ERP projects, uh, big CRM projects. Try try to build in um, 
proper chunks. And I would say the fourth advice, uh, once like, you should consider who is doing this project for you. Like, do you have an in-house team or do you have a proper vendor? Because ideally you need someone who will understand what, what they're doing. So it's not just building another API. Ideally, you need someone who understands what e-commerce is about, what are the corner cases, and uh, put this in the requirement and build it. So uh, four devices here. Uh, uh, again, start with understanding how the system works. Don't, don't build a better world uh, at once. Start with day one and find the proper partner for it. That, that's the, the, really love the advice of you know, the, the incremental value creation, like uh, the, the, we see this as like a, a pattern for success in many different instances uh, in, in, the, in the world of tech, right? Like uh, it's so so hard to believe that, uh, that, uh, that, that there, there are still systems and, and programs run out there that, uh, that they are kept on the air. Like, uh, imagine the amount of suspense, you know, like, uh, the anxiety, like, oh, this is going to be launched in two years, and it'll be this <laughs> massive thing, and the, the amount of pushback, and and the, you know the change management that has to be yes. put into, into it, just to convince people to you know to to buy into a completely huge thing. Like, it's way easier to kind of a uh, gradually, and it, sometimes it's harder, technically speaking. And something mm -hmm. that you know, I see some uh, IT departments pushing for the for the whole new thing because it's easier than keep that level of integration that you mentioned, like, because in launching gradually, you also have to, to do that proper due diligence. As you mentioned, like you yeah. have to understand where the connections that can be, can and all connections and the integration that can be broken there once you introduce some, just something new, right? But it's mm -hmm. certainly much better in terms of buy-in and, and creating the, your own advocates and into the, into the organization that kind of, okay, this is really better. We already see it, you know, so it's kind of a, already delivering value here for us and for our for our customers so it's a it's we, we definitely see that as well so gl glad that you you, you experienced the, the same thing you know let me and ask one, you something one more Go thing ahead. uh before i forgot it like an advice for people who migrate from the plat from existing platform to have this commerce that might be extremely scary for you because you like now you will need more than just one, let's say, Shopify or WordPress developer. Now you will need a proper team, either partner or in-house team to support this integration. But just think of the level of flexibility that now you will be able to offer to your customers because now you won't have constraints in regards to what you can offer. And now you'll be able to go beyond the uh, being just a product company. Now you'll be able to be a service company and now you, you'll be able to provide an additional service to, to customers, to your clients. And this is why a lot of people select a certain brand, not just because the product is great, but also because an additional value they get out of it. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. Like uh, the, 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 to, to deal with headless, if you're coming from an off-the-shelf product, like uh, the, you need two capabilities that if you don't have, you have to prepare yourself to have, which is CX and engineering, right? Like, uh, <laughs> Right, where yes, you only kind of right. just kind of configure a system to work. Now you need proper, you know, uh, CX designers and proper architects and proper software engineers to to actually go and, and you know, and build uh, the parts of the experience that you really want uh, to customize. Right. So that's that's an important uh, tip. But but also it's a it's a, as I said, like it's great to to have that flexibility, right? To expand on top of the whatever you have there, right? So and it, it's funny how, how's that experience was for you that you mentioned a little bit right so there, there's there's uh coming from a 100 percent customized where you have 100 percent of flexibility right like uh you can build whatever you want as long as you have the resources right like uh, the time and the, and the money to build it uh how, how was it for to convince at least your partners your uh your people on on, on marketing and, and and your your uh, uh business partners at at Sandberg? To go to a, a little more restrictive um, uh, environment, it's not 100%. We cannot build, as you mentioned, a couple of promotions. And, you know, there, 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 you, there are some constraints, right, that are supported. So you have to adjust to that world. How, how was that migration? Uh, mainly for your, uh, you know, for your, your people in the, in the business to adjust to that. Like, uh, that they, was a trade-off there, like, okay, but it will go much faster with the functionality that's already built in. 
well, how how you dealt with that uh, with with that migration to a, a more constrained world? I would say um, from that was more requested from business side because um, like when you uh, talk to people in the industry, they usually got used to certain platforms or certain functionality that already exist, and they want to have it now. So when you sell it, you actually sell, hey, like we, you won't have to wait until we build it. You will have it right in time for you to do your job and you will be able to achieve it. I would say um, the most important it was to sell to the engineering team to support it and saying, hey, guys, now instead of building everything, we will build partners here and there. But instead, we'll be able to focus on the development or of what makes us unique what makes Severed, uh in our case unique what like what no one else can do so this is a win-win for everyone the only important part here for me as a cto is to build the integration the way that we still can build on top of something like let's say if we're talking about discounts uh yes like we are using the uh the third party engine it it puts full capacity but if something like uh, something truly unique will be needed we'll be able to update it we'll be able to build something on top of it that will still allow our marketing team to use the same uh instrument with some tweaks but uh we will still benefit from it and this is again what i like about uh headless you don't need a full platform you have an ability to pick different vendors to solve your particular problem if you don't like at some point one vendor and say you don't like a vendor who gives you a loyalty program you can pick another one replace it and you already have everything on your side so it will be mostly about migration the data migration coupon cost from one platform to another but, but everything else is already done and you won't need to migrate the entire platform this is the flexibility that i like a lot Cool, really cool. Uh, one, one last question before we finish, and uh, just trying to understand when, when the, the modules that you migrated, uh, did you kind of a reuse uh, any of that presentation layer code, or you just reuse uh, layouts, or reuse anything, or just kind of adjust it to the to a new uh, interface that uh, that uh, the new headless covers? Like, what, what was the approach that you used there to kind of mm -hmm. keep to keep the, the, the again the, the the look and feel and, and the experience uh, closest closest to what you wanted to be, or mm -hmm. just uh, the, what was more like a back office integration. What, what, what was the approach? So as the reason why it's called headless, like you don't need to change the head, and that's what happened in our case. Customers won't see difference because it will be the same interface they've been using for the last several months. The only difference will be for business uh, users because now they'll have to interact with a different platform to create products, to create, uh, to edit orders and things like that. And uh, again, this is uh, another benefit of Headless. Like you have no constraint in regards what kind of interface you want to build, what you want to put there, how often you want to change it. Uh, you don't depend on issues uh, on the uh, platform side. Like if you want to have I know certain GIFs on your website, you can put them and uh, it will make you and your customers happy. So um, to answer your question again, no, like nothing changes from the phone store. Everything is on the back end and it's again piece by piece. Really cool. Well, uh, Andre, th thank you so much for your wisdom. Uh, I hope the, the audience here can uh, can tap into your experience, you know, to prepare for their own journeys around headless, if it's headless commerce or CMS or, or other uh, or other types of architecture that are, that are kind of heavily, uh, you know, customer experience driven and but but need to be you know competitive and and and, and maintained and uh, and and move fast, right? So uh, that we we're very excited with we're, we're involved in many implementations of such uh, such experiences that, and we, we love to tap, tap into real stories uh, with uh, you no know, real challenges and, and real strategies to to overcome them. Well, th thank you so much for sharing sharing the, your those stories here, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you. See you in the next episode. Bye bye.